Let's look at our periodic table of uh, chemical elements. Syrian, named after Ceres, a nephilim. Europium, named after Europa, the Phoenician girl that got raped by Zeus, that's a few. Helium, we use the word helium all the time, don't you? Helium is a nephilim, it's Helios, the Greek sun god. Mercury, in a thermometer, there's Mercury. Well, that's the god, Mercury, the god to the underworld, the nephilim that takes you to hell. Neptunium, named after Neptune, god of the oceans, a nephilim. Plutonium, now we're getting into space age stuff. Plutonium, you can make a bomb out of plutonium. Guess what? Pluto, the bombing of hell, a demon. Apropos, isn't it? A plutonium bomb is named after hell. Prometheum, named after Prometheus, a titan punished by Zeus, a nephilim. Selenium, named after Selene, uh, Selene, a titan new goddess, Nephilim. Thorium, named after the Norse god Thor, god of Thunderbolt, Nephilim. Titanium, never touch titanium, born anything made of titanium, heard of titanium. Why is titanium so strong? Because it's named after Titan, the first generation of giants, Nephilim. And uranium. You know uranium, the stuff that's inside the atomic bomb, named after Uranus, the first unit of the universe. The most powerful thing a man's ever built or exploded is named after the first bomb. Is that interesting? All right, let's come back to Earth. We have a North Atlantic and South Atlantic Ocean. Where is that from? It's from a god named Atlas. He's a titan who lost the war against Zeus. He was condemned. Uh, actually, Zeus condemned most of the titans to Tartarus, which is the center of hell, but made Atlas stand on Gaia, which is Earth, to hold out Uranus, sky, to separate them. He is either a Nephilim, or I imagine he might be a Watson, one of the angels that, that fell in the name of the moon. We have the Atlas Mountains. They range across Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. We have the myth of Atlantis, a mythical continent described by Plato, Solon, and Egyptian priests. This is a map by Athanasius Kircher in 1669, saying that there was a continent in between Europe and the Americas. Uh, it's described as an advanced civilization. It says that they came to attack Greece, but met with tragedy because in one day it sank into the ocean named after the god of astronomy and navigation, the son of Iapetus and Asia in Nephilim. The continent Asia is the biggest continent in the world. It contains 30% of the landmass of the Earth. It's the most populous continent. Four billion people live there, in other words, 60% of humanity lives in Asia. Did any Asian know where the name Asia comes from? Yep, Nephilim. The wife of Iapetus, the mother of Atlas, Prometheus, and a bunch of others. She's the daughter of Oceanus and Tethys, the granddaughter of Uranus and Gaia. Nephilim. Europe, named after Europa, who was a Phoenician or an Arab mortal, a woman that was abducted to the Greek island of Crete and raped by Zeus. You can see stamps and coins. Featuring this. This is not something in the ancient past. It's on the modern currency. And Europa gave birth to a bunch of left wing like Minos. If you ever go to Crete, Minos is the father of the Minoan civilization, a very advanced civilization that just appeared out of Minoan. How do you understand civilizations that built amazing architecture that lasts 3,000 years later? We can't even build a house that lasts for 10 years. The Bible will do it, it tells you these guys have help. They were hybrids and they got advanced technology from the fallen angels. Then, if you go to Egypt, still there today, the Sphinx, what is that? It's a Nephilim, it's a human with a lion body and eagle wings. These Sphinx are not just the imagination of the Egyptians, they're everywhere. You can find the Sphinx in palaces of Darius the Great, that's a Persian, before 80 BC. The oldest space is the lower left corner uh, at a palace of Queen 
peptic families, the second, all of these things are hybrids, methylene. Butyl was ruled by hybrids. Queen Nefertiti's skull is always elongated. Shows you she was not fully human. She's a hybrid, methylene. The art in ancient Egypt shows giants with elongated heads, worshiping Helio, the sun god, methylene. You go over to India and Southeast Asia, you find the most famous story, the Ramayana, that takes demigods, giants like the Yak, which appear in the art of Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Sri Lanka. Who are the Yaks? Nephilim. Ravana, the antagonist of Ramayana, adopted Rama's wife Sita and cut off the wings of Chakrayu. Hinduism is replete with stories of demigods, human hybrids, and animal hybrids. How come they're all talking about the same thing? The ancients cared about these demigods. But surely modern people have evolved beyond this cult of hybrid demigods. Surely we don't care about that anymore. Is that right? I'm going to answer that question in the next session. Okay, I hope you guys took some notes on how much of our culture revolves around these Greek and Roman gods, like naming our days of the week after them. In fact, we're going to take a look at Christmas and how that's Saturnalia. said that these create a new world order? Can it really be said that we're building a new world order when it's almost exclusively the United States who will be fighting in the desert? Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, and Halloween are holidays that believers should not be celebrating. All of these holidays are founded on pagan roots, not the Bible. Christmas is a pagan fertility ritual. It began in Rome as the Feast of Saturnalia, honoring the Roman god Saturn, then moving on to the Feast of Sol Invictus, also called the Birthday of the Unconquerable Sun honoring the Roman sun god. Yahushua was not born on December 25th. The Bible does not give an exact date for his birth, but if we follow the Jewish calendars in accordance to scripture, we can see that he was born on the fall, around the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. As a matter of fact, many pagan gods, including the Roman gods and ancient Egyptian gods, were born on December 25th, gods like Mithras. The wicked king Nimrod was also born on December 25th. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2 to 4 states, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. One can very easily liken these verses to the custom of setting up a Christmas tree. The Christmas tree, or eulog, represented a phallic symbol. The Christmas tree was decorated in order to bring it some sort of honor, in hopes that the pagan god of fertility, Frere, among other fertility gods, would hasten childbirth and give barren wombs pregnancy. Christmas is heavily rooted in Norse pagan mythology. That Christmas is of pagan origin is hardly a matter of debate. It is a matter of fact that the same date was celebrated by the pagan Romans as the birthday of the sun god and had originated in the Babylonian mystery religion. Common themes and items used during Christmas are of pagan origins as well, such as mistletoe, holly berries, and wreaths. Mistletoe is a parasitic plant which the Druids used as charms. Holly berries were believed to be sacred for the sun god. Wreaths were used by pagan druids as well. The boar and goose were animals commonly offered by pagans to the sun god. The Norse and Anglo-Saxon tribes would burn a yule log to honor Thor. The Scandinavians even adopted the word yule, which meant wheel or sun, as their word for Christmas. The Christmas tree may be traced back to the worship of oak trees by the Anglo and Germanic tribes, but goes back even further to the use of trees in the worship of Tammuz by the Babylonians, which I will cover when I speak about Easter. Santa has a pagan origin as well. Ever notice how Santa Claus looks just like Odin the Allfather, the highest god of Norse paganism? When the Norse burned the Yule log, they believed that the goddess Hertha would appear in the fireplace and bring good luck upon the home. Christians replaced the goddess Hertha with Saint Nicholas, an anti-Semitic 4th century quote-unquote saint, whose feast day was near Christmas time. The Dutch called St. Nicholas Sinterklaas, which was picked up in America as Santa Claus. 
Santa Claus retains godlike qualities. He is apparently omniscient since he knows who is naughty and nice. He is omnipresent since he visits all the children of the world in one night, and perhaps even omnipotent, and at the very least has magical powers. Instead of children worrying about living holy lives pleasing to Yahushua, they instead worry about being behaved so they can receive worldly presents from Santa, which often leads many children to idolatry as well. Even if one wanted to celebrate Christmas for Yahushua alone, the world completely overshadows it with the commercial aspects of Santa and holiday sales. It is interesting that Santa is an anagram of Satan. Old Nick is a nickname used both for Satan and Santa Claus. For example, look at the movie that came out in the year 2000, called Little Nicky, in which Adam Sandler played the son of Satan. In fact, because of its well-known pagan origins, Christmas was actually illegal in early colonial America and only gradually became a legal holiday in the United States. It was not until 1856 that Christmas was made a legal holiday in Massachusetts, the last of the U.S. states to accept Christmas as a legal holiday. Although many Christians see Christmas as a Christian holiday, Christmas is actually a very worldly holiday. Non-Jews do not join with Jews to celebrate Jewish holidays, and non-Muslims do not join with Muslims to celebrate Muslim holidays. So why do non-Christians join with Christians to celebrate Christmas? Why do pornographic magazines feature special Christmas editions? Why do topless bars and gay bars, as well as strip joints, host Christmas parties? Why do non-believers love Christmas? Because Christmas is clearly a worldly holiday. On this day, Christians and non-believers join in the celebration of the High Carnival of the Year. While Nazarene Jews and others abstain from this pagan holiday are called ignorant and narrow-minded for objecting to Christmas observance. On this day, the whole world pretends to love Yahushua, even though Yahushua said the whole world hates him. The only holiday a believer should celebrate in December is Hanukkah. Because these two-faced liars are performing the ancient ritual of the Seder of Saturn during Saturnalia. You see, Saturnalia was worshipped on December 17th, which is seven days before Christmas. This is the time of inversion, thus everything is upside down. You see, this was the time of the purge, where slaves become masters, the orgies and debauchery and transvestism, which is the meaning behind the transvestite, the baphomet, the sabbatic goat. So wait, before I continue, remember that I told you the Illuminati uses the ignorance of the people against themselves. You see, we all begin life with a mind that is pure, clean, and innocent. It's like an empty white room until you start to fill that room up. And it's what you fill that room up that counts. And is your room full and cluttered? Or is it clean and organized? And you see, the mind control is to make you believe that you have a clean and organized brain. But the truth is, your brains are actually scrambled eggs. Which is why the yoke is on you. And that's why the Illuminati programs what goes into your room. And they use the simple principle of the order of care, which is the order out of chaos, which is why, like I said, the average person has absolutely no idea how the world actually works. The reality they give us is all a lie. So like I said, they use the ignorance against ourselves. They want us to be dazed and confused and just get dumber and dumber. And of course, they want to keep us scared. So in order to find the truth, you have to look behind their mass of lies. And when you lift the veil of lies, you find the truth. And behind that curtain is where you will find the trick of belief, which is why they want you to believe in a lie. Because there is no magic. It's all just a trick from the two-faced liars.